everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. So it's officially February and since it's my birthday month, I'm going to treat myself and hopefully the rest of you by making videos throughout this month about cases and stories that have intrigued me and drawn me in. This month, you're going to get a series on Bonnie and Clyde, which I've been working on in my spare time for a few months now. My spare time has been limited, so there's a lot of work left to do. And there's going to be other cases that I've been obsessed with and interested in. Today marks the start of that with the mystery from 1995 that I've known about since I covered the case of the Isdell woman on my channel two Halloweens ago. And recently, Netflix's Unsolved Mysteries reboot also showcased it in one of their episodes. Now, I have a lot of thoughts and theories about this case. I've spent way too long, hours, researching the smallest things involved in the case, tracking down little pieces of evidence, trying to put the puzzle together. So I am excited to share everything with you today and to get a conversation going. On Saturday, June 3rd, 1995, an unidentified woman was found dead in a hotel room in Oslo, Norway. Her death was eventually ruled as a suicide, even though much of the evidence contradicts that conclusion. Although her story has been told many times and the details of her case have been publicized all over the world, no one has ever come forward to claim her as a family member. No one has ever even come forward to say that they knew her. A year after her death, she was buried at the Oslo Western Civil Cemetery, and there's no headstone to mark her name, date of birth, or date of death, because no one knows who she is. Today, we're going to go over the timelines, the evidence, and the theories, and there's a lot to unpack, so grab a coffee, grab a snack, and get comfortable, because we're going in deep. But first, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Harry's. I have been using and loving Harry's for several years now, ever since my husband started ordering Harry's and I would steal his razors and his blades to shave my legs. Harry's creators, Jeff and Andy, were tired of paying for over-designed, overpriced razors and they just wanted something that was simple and effective and that worked. And they also wanted it at a fair price. So they got a factory and they started making their own products. Now, there might be things in my personal care routine that I let slide. My eyebrows, for instance. You guys are always telling me that I need an eyebrow wax. Thanks for the reminder. If anybody would like to come over and, uh, and babysit my kids and clean my house while I go and get this luxurious eyebrow wax, please be my guest. But I digress. I shave my legs every day, every single day, and I have four for a very long time because it's just more comfortable for me. And with Harry's, I can get a clean and comfortable shave every single time. The razors are simple and comfortable to hold. The blades stay sharp for way longer than any of the ones I used to buy in the stores. And they're so affordable. It almost doesn't even feel right um, how cheap they are, how like affordable they are. They're not cheaply made, but they're cheap to buy. So it's great because I don't have to feel guilty about switching to a new blade because I know I've got like a stockpile of them. Valentine's Day is right around the corner and I think your special someone would love to receive a Winston gift set from Harry's, which includes a limited edition Winston handle that can be engraved with their name or the date, and I think that's just adorable. It also comes with three German-engineered blade cartridges, each with a flex hinge and the lubricating strip to give the most comfortable and clean shave, a foaming shave gel, and a blade cover. And it all comes ready to gift in a Valentine's Day appropriate red box. Don't get me flowers for Valentine's Day. They die. I've got enough candy, you know, to last me a lifetime. Give me something that I can use with the personalized touch of engraving. That's what I say. As a special offer for viewers of this channel, Harry's is giving you $5 off any shaving gift set. All you have to do is go to harrys.com slash Stephanie or click the link in the description box before Valentine's Day to get $5 off a gift set and treat yourself or someone you love to Harry's. Thank you so much to Harry's for sponsoring this video and thanks to all of you out there who understand sponsors are essential to this channel. We need them to continue putting out content. I appreciate you. Let's get started on the video. 
The Oslo woman first pops up on our radar on Monday, May 22nd of 1995. A woman speaking English called the front desk of the Radisson Blue Plaza Hotel in Oslo wanting to book a room. The hotel is known locally as simply the Oslo Plaza, and it was officially opened on March 14, 1990. The grand opening ceremony was performed by Norway's King Olav V, and at the time of completion, it was Norway's first real skyscraper. Even today, it's still the second tallest building in the country. It was remodeled in 2012, but even in 1995, the plaza was considered the place to stay if you were looking for the ultimate in luxury and opulence. The hotel towers above the city with its reflective glass facades that taper off the higher you go, making for a very interesting and beautiful looking design. From the rooms on its 37 floors, you can see gorgeous views of Oslo and its fjords stretching out before you. And if you want to get an even better look, you can hop into the external glass elevator and take it all in. In 1992, a footbridge was built between the plaza and the Oslo Spectrum Arena, which has hosted major events including the Eurovision 1996 Song Contest. As a guest at the hotel, you are within walking distance from the Royal Palace and the National Gallery, which houses Norway's largest collection of art. You are also within a five-minute walk of the Oslo Central train station. Now, the details from this initial phone call between the English-speaking woman and the hotel employee who took the reservation are vague. So we don't know when this woman had originally planned to arrive, but during this call, she gave her name as Jennifer Fairgate, or at least that's what the employee wrote down. Nine days later, on Wednesday, May 31st, Jennifer Fairgate called the plaza and said that her plans had changed, and instead she'd be checking in that same evening, staying two nights and checking out the following Friday. During this call, the woman did not speak English. She spoke fluent German with what the employee that she was speaking with thought was an Eastern dialect or accent. During this call, Jennifer also informed the hotel that she would be arriving with another person, a Louis Fairgate, and that they were a couple from Belgium. That night, at about 10.40 in the evening, Jennifer Fairgate arrived to check in. She had blue eyes, her dark hair was cut short, and she was wearing a long black leather jacket. The hotel was very busy at this time because the last three flights had recently landed at the airport and many people were checking in. Now, I have often wondered about this specific timing feeling that if she had wanted to go unnoticed, this would have been the most ideal time to arrive. Now, one of the hotel employees, the one who checked her in, actually, said there was a long line at this point, and everyone at reception was busy checking in guests. Now, there are two different employees who remember seeing Jennifer Fairgate at the time of check-in, but their versions of seeing her differ. The receptionist who checked her in was Sasha Annenson, and he believed that as he checked her in, she was alone. Very similar to the Isdal woman case I've covered before, Jennifer was given a form to fill in when she checked into the hotel, and on this card, she was expected to fill in you know, certain places on the form that Sasha had indicated, such as her name, date of birth, address, phone number, and passport number. Now, the form itself already had the names Jennifer and Louis Fairgate typed on it, and this was from the information she'd given the hotel when she booked the room. But when she signed the form, she signed it as Jennifer Fergate, not Fairgate. She gave her date of birth as August 28, 1974, which would have made her 21 at the time. She wrote her address as 148 Rue de la Stade, 7968, in the town of Verlaine, Belgium. Under the area where she was asked about her occupation, she wrote Serbis. But in the spaces where there were X's marking the spot for her to write in her passport number and the issuing passport authority, she had written nothing. On the form where it shows what kind of payment she used for the room, the box next to cash is checked, which is fine. There's no laws saying you can't pay for a hotel room with cash. 
However, this was a five-star hotel, and most hotels, even in 1995, required that the people staying there put some sort of credit card on file for what they call incidentals, and incidentals can mean a lot of things. If you do some kind of damage to the hotel room, like you think you're a rock star, so you just smash your guitar into the television set... Having your valid credit card on file ensures that the hotel won't take a hit for that TV that you destroyed. If you order a bunch of room service or drain the minibar during your stay, it can be charged to your card. If you get it into your head to check into a fancy hotel to enjoy the amenities for a couple of days and then sneak out without paying, the hotel can charge your credit card. And the Oslo Plaza was no exception. It had these policies in place that when a guest was checked in, they would need to provide not only a valid credit card, but also a valid form of identification. But Jennifer Fergate was never asked to provide either, and she was allowed to check into her room without giving these things to Sasha. Sasha's supervisor, Evie Yurtsen, also remembered seeing Jennifer when she checked in, but Evie believed that Jennifer was with a dark-haired man who was about six feet tall and appeared to be between 35 and 40 years of age. The Norwegian paper VG has what I believe to be the most extensive coverage on this case, and years later they interviewed both Sasha and Evie. Evie told VG, quote, I'm sure she was with a man. I was at my regular station at reception, and at the other side stood that woman. Next to her was a dark-haired man, end quote. Jennifer was checked into room 2805, and she was given instructions on which elevator to take in order to get to her floor and her room. And she was handed two key cards, and then she left the front desk. Now, a few hours later, both Sasha and Evie claim that they saw Jennifer again. Once again, their recollections of this event vary. Sasha claimed that as he was checking in more guests, he saw Jennifer standing by the elevators alone, and it seemed to him as if she was waiting for someone. Evie saw both Jennifer and the man that she had checked in with at the front desk exchanging American money for kroner, which is Norway currency. Neither Evie or Sasha could remember the exact time, but Evie swears that when she saw Jennifer at currency exchange, this man was with her. Now, the key cards at the Oslo Plaza served two purposes. The first was obviously to allow guests to get into their rooms, but the system of these cards was also able to track when a card was used to enter a room, and it kept a log of this. The log wouldn't show every time the door was opened. So, for instance, if you were already inside the room and you decided to leave, this wouldn't be logged. Or if someone knocked on your door and you opened it to let them in, this wouldn't be logged. Only if a guest was using their card to enter the room. According to the keycard activity log, the room was entered only twice the night of check-in. The first time was at 10.44 p.m., and this would have been after Jennifer had checked in and gone up to her room, and the second time was 12.21 in the morning. Now, this could have been Jennifer entering her room after being seen by Sasha in the lobby by the elevators, or it could have been Jennifer and this unknown male, who allegedly would be Louis Fergate, entering the room after exchanging currency and being seen by Evie. Or maybe they were doing both of these things. Maybe Jennifer was waiting for him by the elevator and then they went over to the currency exchange desk and then they went back up to the room. Now, the card was not used to enter room 2805 again until the next morning, Thursday, June 1st at 8.34 a.m. There were no sightings of Jennifer at the hotel that morning. And it's worth noting that there was no sightings of this unknown male at the hotel ever again. But many people speculate that she could have been returning to her room after having breakfast. It's possible that no one saw her having breakfast at the hotel that morning. It's also possible she left the hotel to have breakfast outside that morning. Once again, we just can't be sure. This same day, Jennifer approached the front desk and changed her reservation again. This time, she She switched her checkout date from Friday to Sunday, and she was given two new key cards. Once again, she was not asked to provide proof of identification or a credit card, and this is something that has always bugged me because it seems to be a huge oversight that a hotel like the Plaza would probably not make. 
When Evie Yurtsen, Sasha's supervisor, was asked about the fact that a guest was allowed to check in without ID or a credit card, she said, quote, It's incomprehensible to me. We had strict routines at the hotel. It just shouldn't be possible, end quote. But when Sasha, the clerk who checked Jennifer in, was asked about it, he claimed that it wasn't out of the realm of possibility, saying, quote, I remember there was a long queue of guests. It was all about assigning rooms as quickly as possible. We mustn't keep the guests waiting, end quote. I would be interested to know if Sasha or any of the other employees checking guests in on the evening of May 31st had repeated this unfortunate process of not taking payment or identification, or if Jennifer was the only one who had slipped by without providing these things. I've stayed at a lot of hotels in my day, and never once have I been given a hotel room without a credit card, no matter how busy the hotel is or how long the line is. But we'll get into that a bit more later on. I guess what I'm trying to say is, Having her get away without giving ID and a credit card once, maybe I could understand. But twice? That's a little bit more difficult to believe. So as I said, Jennifer, or someone else, used her key card to enter the hotel room that Thursday morning at 8.34 a.m. And then after this, she extends her stay at the plaza. But then, the key card isn't used to open the door again until the next morning, Friday, June 2nd, at 8.50 a.m., Now, this could mean two things. Jennifer left the hotel directly after going to the front desk and extending her stay, or she returned to the room and someone who was already inside opened the door for her so she didn't have to use the room key. However, two housekeeping employees entered room 2805 using their key cards at 1244 that Thursday afternoon. So it was actually uh, one senior housekeeping employee and then another new employee that was being trained. Now, the senior employee claimed that on Wednesday, the day Jennifer checked in, she'd been instructed to prepare the room for two people. So she had done what's supposed to be done when two guests are sharing a room. She made sure that there was enough towels, there were two bathrobes, two duvets on the bed. The housekeeping woman noticed on Thursday that only one of the pillows seemed to have been used, and the second duvet had been folded and sort of placed off to the side. So these women went about their business, they restocked the towels, and the discarded duvet was folded and placed in the closet instead of on the bed this time. While in the room, the senior employee also noticed what she called a very nice pair of shoes in a vibrant color that were in the closet, and she thought that they were cool and interesting looking, which is why she noticed them. Now, the presence of the housekeeping staff in Jennifer's room at this time shows that no one else was present in the room, meaning Jennifer and or the man and she was allegedly with, who no one ever saw again, were not there at this time. So at the most, Jennifer Fergate was gone from the Plaza Hotel for roughly 24 hours. And at the least, she was gone for 20 hours if we're going on the theory that Jennifer returned to the room after getting the new key cards and someone inside the room let her in so that her entry wasn't logged. But at some point, she left the room before 1244 and did not return until the next morning at 10 minutes to 9, which is still a lot of hours to be gone from a hotel that you're paying over $200 a night to stay in. Now, there's no evidence, no trace of where Jennifer went while she was gone, but she must have stayed the night somewhere, unless she walked around Oslo all day and all night. There isn't even evidence that Jennifer remained in Oslo. She could have easily walked five minutes to the train station and left the city for the night. Now, at some point on Thursday, while she was gone, someone at the front desk was like, oh, snap, we messed up. And it was discovered that Jennifer Fergate in room 2805 had not given them a credit card to put on file. So the front desk sent a message to the television in Jennifer's room requesting that she contact the cashier and rectify the problem immediately. Now, this would be something that would pop up on your TV. So if you were watching something on the TV and the message popped up, it wouldn't go away until you'd hit OK and acknowledged that you'd seen it. On Thursday, no one acknowledged that they'd seen this message. On Friday morning, the log showed that the key card opened the room door at 8.50 a.m. And at 8.50 a.m., that message that had popped up on the television the day before was acknowledged by someone in the room most likely Jennifer, who had returned, turned on the TV and hit OK to make the message go away so that she could watch something. But Jennifer did not go down and make it right with the cashier. 
Now, a housekeeping employee named Karen Levbrate, who was working on the 28th floor that day, was in the hallway getting some things off her cart when she saw Jennifer walking down the hall in the direction of her room. And as the two women passed each other, Jennifer told her good morning in English before unlocking her room with the card and entering. Just a moment later, the door opened again and Jennifer's hand extended out to hang the Do Not Disturb placard on the doorknob before the door firmly closed. So it is speculated that after this, Jennifer must have left the room and entered again, or someone else entered with a key card, because the last time the key card was ever used was shortly after this at 11.03. And as far as we know, Jennifer Fergate never left that room alive again. At 8.06 p.m. on Friday, Jennifer ordered bratwurst and potato salad from room service, and the employee who delivered it did so at 8.23 p.m. Her name was Kristen Anderson. As is customary, especially in nice hotels, Kristen didn't just drop the food off at the door like DoorDash and leave. She knocked on the door, and she rolled the food cart inside so that she could arrange the meal for the guest. So she was able to make some observations while inside the room. Kristen said that the room was very neat and orderly, almost sterile, as if it hadn't been occupied or lived in much. When she saw the bed, Kristen felt that it had not been slept in since housekeeping had been inside the day before because it was pristine. And apparently the hotel staff, they had a way of making up the bed that was usually very difficult for guests to replicate. Anderson also remembered seeing a wheeled suitcase in the room, which made her wonder if the woman staying there was a flight attendant because the plaza often had flight attendants as guests. Kristen believed that at this time Jennifer was wearing a long skirt, but what got her attention most of all was the large tip that she received from Jennifer. Kristen claimed that Jennifer had a 50 kroner note ready in her hand, saying, quote, I got such a big tip. She had a 50 kroner note ready. It was very unusual for us to get so much of a tip. If we got 10 kroner, we thought that was a lot. She was not interested in small talk. I remember it was easy putting the food on the table because there was nothing on it. End quote. That same night, Friday, someone in the room purchased something to watch on pay-per-view. And the next day on Saturday, another pay-per-view purchase was made. Now, there's no indication in police files of what exactly was purchased or watched. Now, Friday night at 8.57 p.m., the front desk sent another message to Jennifer's TV urging her to contact the cashier about getting a credit card on file. And once again, the message was acknowledged, but Jennifer did not leave the room. Sometime between Friday and Saturday, someone in the room removed and drank three sodas from the minibar, a Coke, a Diet Coke, and an Asina orange drink. I know this is something small, but once again, I've gone over every tiny little bit of this case, and I think it's strange that one person, the same person, would drink both Coke and Diet Coke. I, I don't know. Unless there was only one of each in the mini bar which is never clarified. So if you like Coke and then you drink the Coke, but then there's no more Coke, maybe you would settle for Diet Coke. But I'm pretty sure if you like the taste of Diet Coke, you don't really like Coke. And if you don't regularly drink Diet Soda, a Diet Coke will just taste disgusting to you. But that's just my opinion. If Jennifer was truly the only one in the room, it is something that stood out to me. There was also a bag of potato chips that was opened from the minibar. On Saturday, June 3rd, at 7.35 in the evening, another message was sent to the television of room 2805. It was seen, acknowledged, and dismissed. So you might be asking yourself, like, why didn't they just go up to her room and knock on her door and ask her to, you know, put a credit card on file. Well, she had the do not disturb sign on her door since, you know, Friday morning. So it is kind of typical for the hotel staff to not disturb a guest when they have the do not disturb sign hung up. But at this point, it's getting ridiculous, right? Jennifer's seen these messages. She's acknowledged them. They know she's seeing them. So Evie Yurtson, who was working the desk that night, was like, there's something going on here, right? And an employee was sent up to the 20th floor to see what exactly was going on. And she returned with the news that the Do Not Disturb sign was still hanging on the door, as it had been since Friday morning. And they knew this because housekeeping had not been in to clean the room or turn down the bed due to the presence of the sign. So the hotel security team was notified. And at 7.50 that evening, a member of the security team, his name was Espen Nas, he knocked on the door of room 2805. 
Now, according to Espen, just a few moments after he knocked, he heard the unmistakable sound of a gunshot from inside the room. And at that point, he was like, oh, damn, this is not good. And he raced to the elevator, went down to the lobby where the security office was located, and he let his supervisor know what had happened. At this point, the team decided to call the Oslo police and give them the names of the people who were allegedly staying inside the room, Jennifer and Louis Fairgate, so that they could make sure, you know, these people weren't known criminals or something and they wouldn't be walking into anything sketchy. I'm pretty sure if you hear a gunshot go off in a room, you're going to be walking into something sketchy regardless, but I, I get it. Well, as it turns out, neither Jennifer Fairgate or Louis Fairgate ever existed. They just weren't real people. The security supervisor went up to room 2805 at 8.04 p.m. and he knocked before using his special security guy key card to enter. Now, I say it was special because the security team were the only ones who had a key card that could bypass the double lock, which means that someone inside the room had locked the door from the inside. So if any other staff, including housekeeping and front desk, if they tried to get in, their key cards could only open the door if it was not locked from the inside. Now, the security supervisor claims at this point when he used his card to enter, that's when he realized the door had been locked from the inside. And this will become a huge part of the case, especially for me. Once inside, the supervisor said the room was dark, the television was on, but he couldn't really see like deeply into the room, so he called out several times. And when no one answered, he ventured a bit deeper into the room, and that was when he spotted the body of a woman lying on the hotel bed. She wasn't moving. He was calling out, you know, hello, security. She wasn't responding. And there was a strange smell in the room, a sharp, acrid smell. So he backed out of there, shut the door behind him and called the police. According to hotel security and the police, the only time the room was left unguarded was the period between 7.50, when the first security guard, Espen, had heard the gunshot and went to the lobby, and 8.04, when the security supervisor arrived on the 28th floor. Now, I'm not sure how this could be the case, unless some specific things happened. One, the security supervisor had a phone on his person that he used to call the police, and he remained at the door of the hotel room, letting his team know that they should escort the police up when the police arrived which wasn't until about an hour later. Or if the security supervisor had not gone up to the room alone and he'd had one or more of his team with him, and then when he left the room, he instructed one of them to go down and call the police and bring them up when they got there. Now, these things could be possible. It's just that they've never been explicitly said. It makes it seem as if this security supervisor was at the room by himself and then he called the police. But he says that the room remained guarded the whole time while they were waiting for the police to get there. And while we are waiting for the police to arrive, let's talk about this acrid smell that the supervisor noticed when he entered the room. I read a Screen Rant article about this episode of Unsolved Mysteries, and the author of this article seemed to think that the acrid smell could have been a sign that Jennifer had died before that Saturday, and that what the supervisor was smelling was the scent of decomposition. I personally disagree. Acrid is usually a word that's used to describe an unpleasant, sharp smell. It's what you would smell after walking through a building that had previously been on fire. I suppose it could be used to refer to the smell of human decomposition, but even if Jennifer had died soon after the last sighting of her, which had been the morning before, it would have still taken at least two days for the smell of her body to be noticeable, especially from the entrance of the room while a window in the room was cracked, which in this case it was. I think it's far more likely that what the security supervisor was smelling was the smell of a gun after it's been shot, which if anyone has spent time at a firing range, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It definitely does have a distinctive smell. Okay, the police are here, so let's talk about what they walked into and what was found in the room of Jennifer Fergate, if that is her real name, which it wasn't. But we're going to still call her Jennifer Fergate because I don't know what else to call her. It was Jennifer's body laying on the bed, and the positioning of it was strange, in my opinion. It was as if she'd sat down at the foot of the bed and then just kind of laid down with the upper part of her body. The majority of her upper body was on the bed, but her legs from the knee down were off the bed and the bottom of her black-heeled shoes were touching the floor. In her right hand, Jennifer was holding a 9mm Browning pistol, a semi-automatic handgun that actually has a very interesting history to it, but we'll get there. 
Jennifer had died from a bullet wound to the middle of her forehead, right here. And the hand that held the gun was resting on her chest. But the way she was holding the gun was certainly out of the ordinary. The back of the gun, um, where you would cock it, it was pointing in the direction of her shoes. And instead of her pointer finger being on the trigger, her thumb was. She was also dressed all in black. Black dress, black sheer stockings, black shoes, bra, a pair of silky short-like underwear, and she had a simple gold ring on the middle finger of her right hand, the same hand that was holding the gun. And on her left wrist, she was wearing a Citizen Aqualand diving watch. Now, I've seen some chatter on the internet that this woman was possibly left-handed, but I think the presence of her watch on her left wrist shows that she was, in fact, right-handed. Now, you might be thinking, duh, Stephanie, of course she's right-handed. She's holding the gun in her right hand. And I'm going to (laughs) say, for what I'm sure is like the third or fourth time in this video, we're going to get to that. Now, I only watched it twice, but in the Unsolved Mysteries episode, I don't believe that they mentioned the fact that there was two bullets shot. And if they did, in fact, leave that out, I don't know why they did, because it seems kind of important. But what do I know? The police theorized that the first shot, which went through a pillow on the bed before going through the bed and the bed frame and ending up in the concrete floor beneath the bed, they thought that this was a test shot. And then they believed the second time the gun was shot, the second bullet, that one had gone through Jennifer's head, through the bed, and also ended up in the concrete floor beneath the bed, just about three inches away from what the police believe was the initial test shot bullet. The Browning had been fully loaded when it had been shot, which meant it started off with nine bullets and now there were only seven left. What was strange about that first test shot was that it seemed as if it had been shot into the pillow, but afterwards the pillow was flipped over, which hid the side of the pillow that had the entry point of the bullet, the one that was singed from the bullet. So going on the police theory, she'd shot into the pillow to what, make sure the gun worked, and then turned the pillow over and then shot herself. Now, when the police removed this gun from Jennifer's hand, she still had a very tight grip on it. And it's reported that when they were finally able to get her thumb off the trigger and remove the gun, the forensic tech heard a click. And this is significant to police because they claim that this meant the pressure of her thumb on the trigger had been consistent since she'd fired the gun. And the click was the sound of the trigger being, you know, released. There was blood obviously, all over the bed. There was blood spattered on the bedside table and on the phone, which was located on the bedside table. There was blood on the wall and even some blood spattered on the ceiling. On the floor to her left were the two spent cartridges from the bullets that had been fired. And sitting next to the bed was a black briefcase or attache case. But the only thing inside this case were more bullets, 25 more 9mm bullets to be specific, which would have given Jennifer 34 bullets in total for her Browning pistol. So obviously the police are initially going to believe that Jennifer Fergate took her own life, right? She checked into the plaza with the specific intention of spending her last days in solitude and luxury with the do not disturb sign on her door planning to end it all, which she inevitably did. However, there was so much more about the scene that didn't really support this very cut and dry theory. First of all, there was no blood on either of her hands, and a later exam would show that there was no GSR or gunshot residue on her hands either. Torleve Rognum, a professor of forensic medicine, told VG, quote, The victim had her thumb on the trigger and fingers around the handle, so it's weird that her hands don't have any blood. As a criminal investigator, I find this extremely eye-catching. I expected to find blood on her hands, end quote. Now, her hands being free of blood, I might be able to overlook, but the absence of GSR does make me raise my eyebrows a bit because the police theory was that she'd shot that gun twice, remember? The test shot and then the shot that eventually ended her life. So you'd think there would be some 
gunshot residue on her hands from two shots. Now, according to the website crimescenainvestigator.net, a common misconception is that a negative GSR result is proof that a person did not actually fire a weapon. But there's a few circumstances where this is not the case. A person who fired a gun might have a negative GSR result because a detectable amount of GSR was not deposited. But Jennifer did allegedly fire this gun twice and at close proximity. Now, a lapse of time between the shooting and the GSR test can also lead to a negative result. But this is usually in a case where someone commits a crime with a gun and then the police catch up to them several hours or even several days later. So a good amount of time has passed. Now, according to the police theory, the security guard had heard the shot through the door. The shot that had killed Jennifer, he'd heard it. And the police and forensics team were obviously on the scene within a few hours of this, so that wouldn't be the case either. There wasn't a lot of time that had passed. She wasn't running around Oslo, you know, washing her hands and out in the fresh air. She was in the hotel room. Now, the presence of blood or moisture on the hands can also interfere with any GSR, which can lead to a negative result. But as we know, There was no blood on her hands. So there really should have been some, some residue found, in my opinion. The gun itself was another mystery. They were able to identify it as a Browning because the Browning 9mm pistol was the most common handgun of the post-Cold War era and has been called the world's military handgun of choice. Over 90 countries have purchased, licensed, or imitated the Browning to use it for their military and police forces. It's been called the first of the Wonder Nines, and it was so popular because it's simple, accurate, easy to assemble and disassemble, and it has a large capacity magazine. It was the most common sidearm in NATO during the Cold War. Both British and Argentinians carried it in the Falklands War. Saddam Hussein always had his Browning with him. He always, he loved that thing, and he would randomly shoot it into the air to scare the crap out of people. And even Gaddafi owned a gold-plated Browning that had an image of his face etched into its grips. It was also the gun of choice for the Waffen-SS, the military branch of the Nazi regime. So basically, this is not an uncommon gun, but this one had some oddities about it. Firstly, the serial number had been completely removed, and this in itself isn't strange. We usually see this with illegal weapons so that they can't be traced, but the serial number wasn't just filed off. It seemed as if It had been removed with acid, and whoever had done it knew exactly how deep they needed to go in order to make sure that the entire serial number would never be retrievable. This was done by a professional. This was done by somebody who knew what they were doing. Usually when the serial number is filed off, law enforcement and forensics have tools and technology that can help them decipher it. But whoever had done this knew exactly what to do so that they they couldn't. And they never have been able to, even to this day with new technology. They've only been able to figure out what a few of the numbers were. Now, they were able to determine that the gun had been produced at a factory in Herstal, Belgium, in either 1990 or 1991. But that was it. That was all they were able to figure out. Jennifer Fergate's fingerprints were found in several places in the hotel room. And they were run through Interpol, but no match was found. However... Her fingerprints, or any fingerprints for that matter, were not found on the gun or on the bullets inside the gun. And there was no gloves located on Jennifer or in her hotel room. Norwegian veteran police officer Lennart Kadarlin said, quote, Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get fingerprints from the firearm. The surface and the way the gun is held makes it all extremely difficult. End quote. Okay, but no prints on the bullets inside the gun? or on the bullets in the briefcase. As someone who has loaded and used guns, it would be almost impossible to put bullets into a gun without touching them and leaving prints. And this is often how criminals are caught by the police. They wipe down the gun, but they forget about the bullets inside. I suppose she could have loaded the gun previously, previous to arriving at the hotel, using gloves. But why would she do that if she was going to leave her prints all over the hotel room? And on that note, if Jennifer's plan was to go to the hotel and end her life the whole time, why in the world would she bring a loaded gun and 25 additional bullets? In my opinion, this is something you would have with you for protection, not suicide. And why do a test shot first, shooting through the bed? There are a hundred easier and less painful ways to die than by bullets. If that's what you really wanted to do, end your life, it could have been done a million different ways. 
But if it was me personally, and I'm about to put a gun to my head, I don't want to do a test shot first because it's going to scare the crap out of me. But that's just me, you know, and I'm kind of a wimp uh, when it comes to things like that, I guess. On top of all that, though, many people don't understand how Jennifer retained her grip on the gun after shooting herself. The Browning is a powerful weapon, which would have a pretty powerful recoil. So the position she was found in, it looked almost staged. You would expect to see the gun fly out of her hand due to the recoil. You'd expect to see her hand lying limply either at her side or even off the bed. But her hand was lying neatly on her chest, right, with the gun still in it, firmly in her grasp. Now, there is something called a cadaveric spasm, which some have pointed to in order to explain why Jennifer was still holding the gun. Sometimes the muscles stiffen at the moment of death, and it is a stronger stiffening than rigor mortis. So technically, if that happened, Jennifer would have been able to hold onto the gun, but this is pretty rare. It certainly doesn't happen in every case, and it still doesn't explain how she got her hand to her chest after shooting herself in the head. I mean, I don't want to be graphic, but I figure if you shoot yourself in the head and you're laying down, your hand's going to fall here, not here, right? I don't know. Let me know what you think. Let's talk about what else was in the hotel room. On a table next to the window, there was a plate of partially eaten bratwurst and potato salad, the same meal that Jennifer had ordered from room service Friday night. Now keep in mind, this was Saturday night, but when an autopsy was later done, the medical examiner found undigested food in Jennifer's stomach and the food was bratwurst and potato salad which led to the conclusion that she must have eaten it the same day she died, which is strange because she had ordered it 24 hours prior to her death. So either she ate some of it Friday night and ate some more of it on Saturday, which I find hard to believe because, one, that's gross. There's, like, no refrigerator. There's no way to, like, keep it, you know, fresh. There's no way to heat it up. Gross. And, two... As you can see by this picture, there really wasn't much of it eaten. There's still plenty of food left. So that's weird to me that she'd order something Friday night and it would still be found in her stomach undigested Saturday night. And that is one of the most telling pieces of evidence for those who believe she died prior to Saturday night's. That's one of the most telling pieces of evidence that would support that theory. Now, Jennifer had some clothing in her room besides what she was wearing, and her wardrobe choices were notable for several reasons. Firstly, they were all very nice, well-made, sophisticated clothes in a sort of monochromatic color scheme, you know, a lot of neutral and dark colors. She had four jackets, one shirt, one sweater, four bras, and two pairs of silky underwear shorts, but no pants, no skirts. Nothing, nothing for the bottom of her body. Additionally, the tags on her clothes had all been removed. And this brings me right back to the Isdell woman case, another unidentified woman who was found with the tags cut out of her clothes in Norway, actually. In the hotel room, there was only one pair of shoes found in the room, and those were the black shoes that she was wearing. And the manufacturer's name had been rubbed out of them, but I believe you could still see the words made in Italy. Now, the only items in the room that still had any identifiable tags or marks on them was one blazer, and that was a Rene Lazard brand. There was a green bag in a chair next to the table in the hotel room, and this was Travel Light brand. And the attache or briefcase, which was leather, and that was made by Braun Buffel. Now, next to the plate of food on the table was a bottle of men's cologne. It was called Ungaro. Aside from the cologne, though, there was no other personal care items in the hotel room at all. No toothpaste or toothbrush, no shampoo or conditioner, no makeup or skincare products, which was strange because when Jennifer was found, she was wearing eyeliner. But there wasn't an eyeliner to be found in the room. However, there was evidence that someone in the room had taken a shower. A bathrobe had been removed from the bathroom and thrown on the bed. Housekeeping, who had been in the room on Thursday, had put another set of towels in the bathroom and taken the used ones away. In the crime scene photos taken on Saturday, the day Jennifer was found, you can see a used towel on the floor next to the bathtub. You can also see the soap that the hotel provided. It had been opened and used and was found in the sink. And a midi bottle of shampoo also provided by the hotel had been opened as well and used. If she had no makeup in the room, 
but she had taken a shower, what did she use to apply her eyeliner after showering and washing her hair? It's pretty difficult to wash your hair and not get water on your face, and unless this was the most waterproof eyeliner ever created in the history of the world, where it lasted for days without coming off, it just doesn't make any sense. In the green travel light bag, police found a pair of black stockings, three bras, and a black silk top. In the chair opposite the travel light bag, a white item can be seen in the crime scene photos, but it's not noted in the police reports, so it's not even mentioned. They don't say what it is. But the staff members of the plaza believe that it was a rolled-up bedspread. And remember that duvet that the staff had found in the room on Thursday? Remember there had been two duvets placed in the room Wednesday because they were told to get the room ready for two guests. Jennifer and Louis Fairgate, but after the first night, the staff saw that she'd only used one pillow and that the second duvet had been folded and put to the side, so the staff folded it up and put it in the closet. When the police entered the room on Saturday, that second duvet was out of the closet and on the bed. Additionally, that fancy pair of vibrant shoes that one of the staff had made note of, they were nowhere to be found in the room, and the suitcase on wheels that Kristen Anderson had seen on Friday was not there either. Neither was the long skirt that Kristen had claimed Jennifer was wearing when she'd brought the room service in on Friday. But as far as anyone could tell, Jennifer had not left the room from Friday morning to Saturday night. So where had these things gone? On the other side of the room, there was a counter where the mini bar was located, and that's where the three bottles of soda and the open bag of potato chips were found, along with a bag that held a newspaper, a USA Today newspaper. The paper was provided to each guest by the hotel and would be delivered to the rooms that were indicated by the room number on the bag. Now, on this bag that held the newspaper, a fingerprint was found, the only fingerprint in the room that was not Jennifer's. Additionally, it was not Jennifer's room number on the bag. It was room 2816, which was on the same floor and across the hall from Jennifer. Now, this fingerprint was apparently entered into Interpol in 2017, but I've heard no word on whether or not they found a match, and you think that they would know by now. And there is no indication that at this time in 1995, the police even questioned the person who'd been staying in room 2816 during the dates of May 31st to June 3rd. And by the time the media outlet, VG, began investigating, the hotel no longer had records from that year. Now, there were other people staying on the floor that both the police and VG questioned. Um, We'll get to that in a moment. Next to the minibar table, there was an ironing board leaning against the wall and an iron that was placed on the luggage holder. But the hotel had no record of Jennifer ordering these things to her room. And in 1995, they wouldn't have provided these things to the room without a request. And there's no record of a request. The luggage table also held the long leather jacket that Jennifer had been wearing when she checked into the hotel, which could have hid the fact as she wasn't wearing pants, unless when she checked in, she was wearing the same clothes that she eventually died in, which was the black stockings and black dress, and that is very possible. Also, absent from the room was pretty much everything you would expect someone to have. There was no identification, no passport, no wallet, no purse, no car keys, no house keys, no money, no receipts for purchases, No plane tickets or train tickets, no travel itinerary, no books, no magazines, no pictures, no personal items whatsoever. Anything that could possibly point to the identity of this woman was missing from the room. Now, was it missing because she had never brought it or was it missing because somebody had taken it, maybe put all that stuff into that rolly little suitcase and left? Now, like I said, at first the police thought, you know, this was just a sad case of a woman taking her own life. But as soon as they saw the discrepancies with the lack of blood and gunshot residue on her hands, as well as the lengths that she had taken to conceal her identity, including checking into the hotel under a fake name, they began trying to figure out who she really was. And they considered the possibility that someone else might have been involved with her death. She had booked the room for two people, after all, herself and a Louis Fairgate. But aside from the possible sightings of a man with her that first night she checked in, no one else had ever seen a man with her at any other time. And there was no indication that anyone had been in the hotel room with her, besides maybe that men's cologne. But 
I wear men's cologne sometimes because I like how it smells, so I certainly wouldn't say that's solid evidence of the presence of another person. So they decided to start with the information that they had, which was the information that she'd written down on her registration card, her address, her phone number, the company she worked for, etc. Now, the address she'd written down was in the town of Verlaine, Belgium. The address just didn't exist. In the Unsolved Mysteries episode, a journalist from VG who'd been looking into Jennifer's case for years, he actually traveled to Verlaine and he found a Rue de la Station in Verlaine, but the house numbers only went up to 98 and she'd written down 148. And additionally, she'd written down not station, but stedate, I believe, S-T-E-D-A-T-E. That's probably not the right way to pronounce it, but... That's what she wrote down. However, the handwriting is kind of messy. You know, it's a very small space to write a lot of stuff. So she could have just been writing over what she'd already written and it could be not clear. Maybe she meant to write something else, but that address was not in Verlaine regardless. Additionally, the zip code that she wrote down, 7968, it wasn't even Verlaine's zip code. Now, in the show, they claim the zip code doesn't exist. And I guess in a way, it doesn't exist in Belgium, but... When you type it into Google, 7968 is in fact a postal code in Hungary, in a place I cannot pronounce and won't even try to pronounce because I just can't. I'm looking at it right now. I can't. I can't pronounce it, but I'm going to place it on the screen for you. If I was going to try to pronounce it, I would say it was Felsozentomarton, but I know it's wrong. The phone number that Jennifer wrote down was not in service either, but it was at least a Belgian area code. While the VG journalist Lars Christian Wagner was in Berlin, he spoke to the mayor of the town who'd lived there his whole life. Lars felt that there must have been some reason Jennifer used Belgium so much, like maybe she knew someone there or she'd lived there for a portion of her childhood or she was familiar with the area. She gave her address as being in Belgium, her phone number, her place of work. She even made two calls from the hotel to Belgium area codes, but neither of these numbers she called was a real number either. So the mayor looked at her picture and he was like, no, you know, I've never seen her. I don't recognize her. And neither did any of the other people living in Berlin. And it's not a big town. Now, Jennifer had written service down as her employer, C-E-R-B-I-S, but no such company was found in Belgium. So they concluded that it didn't exist and it was another false lead. Now, I remembered seeing the word service somewhere. So I did some Googling and I found out that service is an acronym for Civil Engineering Research-Based Initiative Services. Uh, so it's a thing. Maybe she wrote down service, meaning for it to be an occupation, not a company. Maybe she was a civil engineer or maybe that was her cover story at least because I think we all know where I'm going with this, right? I believe Jennifer Fairgate was an intelligence agent, a real life spy. I'm going to jump ahead a bit and then come back because there is a discussion I want to have since I believe this woman was from Germany. In November of 2016, Jennifer's body was exhumed so they could use new technology to see if they could figure out more about her. Exactly in the same way that they tested the Isdal woman's teeth, Jennifer's teeth were tested as well. Now, during the Cold War, between 1955 and 1963, there had been above-ground nuclear test bombs that were set off all over the world. And this stupid testing increased the levels of C-14 in the atmosphere. So people born during and after this time would have increased levels of C-14 in the enamel of their teeth and probably all over their bodies. It's just awful to think about. But based on the amount found in the enamel of the teeth compared to the amount that was in the atmosphere during specific years, they were able to determine that Jennifer was most likely born in 1971, not 1974, as she'd written down. She had claimed to be 21 by giving her birth date as 1974. The medical examiner who performed her autopsy put her age closer to 30, and this testing put her age at 24 in 1995. It was also discovered that she was of European descent, most likely from the area of Germany and more specifically East Germany. She'd also had dental work done using gold and porcelain, which would not have been cheap, by the way. It was widely used in the United States, but also in some parts of Europe, including the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Germany. So let's talk about the things Jennifer had that can be tracked. 
Her watch was a citizen watch that had been made in Japan. Interpol conducted an investigation of the Japanese watch factory and found out that the watch was three years old and it had been made in 1992, but there was no record of who had sold it or who it had been sold to. Inside the watch were three 370 type batteries made by the Swiss battery factory Renata. The batteries had been made in 1994, and the factory told investigators that they had been sent out to wholesalers and dealers in December of 1994 and January of 1995. But the factory produced millions of batteries a month, so there was no way to determine where these three batteries had ended up. Each of the batteries were hand-inscribed with W395, which is apparently how watchmakers notate the date of a battery change in a watch. W395 most likely meant that the batteries had been replaced in March of 1995, just three months before she died, and they had been replaced by a watchmaker with the initial of W. Now, the men's cologne, Angaro, I found out that it had been launched in 1991, and, you know, it seems to be pretty generic. It was very popular, it was widely available, widely purchased, widely used at the time, and you could have gotten it at any Walmart or drugstore. Now, the black leather attaché, which was made by Braun Buffel, a German designer of luxury and leather goods since 1887, that is a little bit more interesting. In 1995, Braun Buffel had no stores in Norway or Belgium or the United States, but they did have 13 stores in Germany. And this is 1995, so buying things on the internet, it certainly wasn't as common as it is today. The brand also seemed to be pretty expensive, anywhere from six to $800 for a briefcase, which is certainly more than I would ever pay for a bag to hold my bullets. Now, the brand Rene Lazard, that was who made one of Jennifer's blazers, that's also a German brand, a medium-sized German fashion group founded in 1978, located in Wurzburg. Now, they make clothes for what is known as the gold range, which is considered, you know, not high fashion but not mass market either. And the clothes are described as being smart and sober, like a northern European city in the rain or snow. Now, today, René Lazard still has no stores in Norway, so they didn't have them in 1995 either, though they did have several in Germany. In fact, René Lazard didn't even make it to the United States until 1997 when they opened their first U.S. store in New York City's Soho district. So um, I think that Jennifer probably bought her Rene Lazard blazer, and her attaché to hold her bullets. She probably bought those in Germany, I'm going to assume. Uh, the Travel Light bag, the green one, that's also a German company, a German-manufactured company, but those seem to be kind of more readily available, like easier to get. Um, I couldn't really track down a lot about it. Every time I type it in, it just comes up with, like, Amazon <laughs> links, which is so annoying. Like, Jeff Bezos, can you please just get out of, you know, every aspect of my life, please, for a second? And it was hard to kind of track it back to, like, an origin point or figure out, you know, when they became more mainstream and started selling to different areas of, of the world. But from these these possessions she had that we can track down, I, I can tell that she clearly had some money at some point, right? Renee Lazard clothes aren't cheap. Her briefcase was hella expensive. The Citizen watch would have run her, you know, between three and five hundred dollars. And even though no money or cash was found in her room, she must have had money at some point because she tipped very well for her room service. Maybe she tipped so much because it was like the last of the cash she had and she wanted to get rid of it knowing that she wasn't going to be around for much longer for whatever reason, whether or not, you know, someone was after her or she was planning to take her own life. I don't know. But she clearly used Belgium as her cover story, right? And some people speculate that she made calls from the hotel to Belgium area codes that were, you know, maybe wrong numbers. Maybe she couldn't remember the number of who she was trying to call, or maybe she'd gotten their number wrong. So she she kept trying to, you know, call this person. I don't know what those numbers are. I would have to see them and see if they were comparable. Like, you know, is there just one number difference? That would be more indicative to me that she was trying to remember a number. Personally, what I think it was was just another part of her cover. So if she makes two calls to area codes that are in the country that she claims to live in, you know, if anybody comes looking for her after or is questioning who she was, they might just look at her phone history and be like, oh, yeah, she called, you know, the country that she lives in. So that's great. I think 
it was part of her cover. But that's just my opinion. Now let's talk about the other guests who are staying on the 28th floor at the plaza at this time. And as I go through this, I'm going to place a graphic on the screen for you to follow along. So there was room 2803, which was the room next to Jennifer's. And this room was vacant at the time of the incident. Room 2801, which was next to the vacant room, was occupied by the Nilsborgs, and they had not heard or seen anything worth reporting. Room 2806, which was across the hall and to the left of Jennifer's room, was occupied by the Hogstads, and they also didn't hear or see anything worth reporting. Room 2807 was the room directly to Jennifer's left, and that was occupied by the Zobriests, who also heard nothing and saw nothing. The only person who thought they heard something was a woman staying in room 2816, which was across and down the hall from Jennifer's. She claimed that in the middle of the night, she was woken up by the sound of a door closing, like a muffled thud. Now, I tend to believe that what she heard is not related to what happened to Jennifer, considering she was the furthest room away from Jennifer's, and none of the rooms that were closer to Jennifer heard anything, especially the one right next to her that was occupied, and Jennifer didn't die in the middle of the night, if we believe the police timeline. Now, the room directly across from Jennifer's, room 2804, has a little bit more of an interesting story to it. A man who was staying there was tracked down by VG, and it turns out that he was a Belgian businessman who was in Oslo for work, and he checked in on Friday and checked out on Saturday morning. The Oslo police never interviewed him, but when VG found him, he didn't want to talk. He, like, wouldn't open the door, and he told them through the closed door that he was not available to talk. So VG and Lars Wagner continued trying to contact him, and finally a few days later, this man, who's referred to only as Mr. F, he called Lars, and he's like, you know, what's this all about? Why are you trying to talk to me? And Lars explained about Jennifer's death and asked if Mr. F had seen or heard anything since he'd been staying directly across the hall from Jennifer. Now, Mr. F told Lars, quote, I remember that incident very well because they asked me about it at reception before I left the hotel. Someone asked me had I heard or seen anything because it occurred in the same hallway, but I slept my night well and didn't know anything about it, end quote. Which would have been fine, except Mr. F had allegedly checked out Saturday morning, according to him. And Jennifer wasn't found dead until Saturday evening. So Lars asked Mr. F, uh, how were you asked about a death that hadn't happened yet? To which Mr. F responded, quote, I don't know anything about that. I only remember them asking me, that's all I know, end quote. And that was the last time Mr. F talked to Lars or anyone else, he declined to have any further comment. Now, the strange thing is, it seemed as if the Plaza Hotel didn't really want to cooperate with VG either. The paper reported, quote, Hotel management does not want VG to talk with the reception worker who spoke twice to Fergate. In fact, the hotel doesn't want VG to interview any workers of the hotel, either current or retired, end quote. Now, the person that was staying in room 2816 is still unknown, like I said. But I think the presence of the paper in Jennifer's room could have easily been a mistake made by the hotel. They may have dropped the wrong paper at the wrong room and the fingerprint on that bag may very well turn out to be one of the hotel staff members. But of course, there could be less innocent and more nefarious reasons for its presence in her room. During the autopsy, three days after her death, Jennifer was tested for alcohol, which came back negative, but she was tested for no other drugs. Her fingernails were not scraped to see if she'd been involved in a struggle and, you know, gotten her attacker. And she was not examined for signs of sexual activity prior to her death or sexual assault. After an investigation, the Oslo police could find nothing that suggested Jennifer's death had been the result of a homicide. And they ruled it as 99.9% suicide, and they buried her. They waited a year in case anybody came forward and claimed her, but after that year had passed, they destroyed all of her belongings and all of the evidence, except for her ring and her watch, which were sold at auction, and the Browning pistol, which was kept by the police as an example of what a gun looked like when the serial number had been expertly removed. Now, a huge driving force for the reason police believed no one else could have been responsible was the fact that Jennifer's room had been locked from the inside, and they didn't believe there was any way for someone to have been in the room when she was killed and then leave the room with it still remaining locked from the inside. 
There were, of course, windows in the room, but no balcony that someone could have climbed out onto. Now I have some problems with this being their main piece of evidence against foul play because the only reason the police think that they know it was double locked was because the security supervisor said that when he opened it with his keycard, he found out that it was double locked. And even if it was double locked, it's not as if it would have been impossible to leave the room in the amount of time that the door wasn't guarded and then make it look as if the door had been locked from the inside. I looked it up. It's possible, especially with key cards. Additionally, the hotel did have security cameras, but there's no indication that the police ever requested or viewed the footage, which seems to be a huge missed opportunity, right? And there are so many questions left unanswered. Why did she use a fake identity to check in? How was she able to check into the hotel and stay there for so long without providing valid ID and payment information? Who was Louis Fergate? And if she checked into the hotel to end her life, why would she bother even mentioning that there was another guest with her if there wasn't? Where did she go for those 20-something hours that she wasn't in her room? Why would she bring so many bullets if she planned only to take one life, her own? Why has no one ever come forward to claim her or to even say that they knew her or recognized her? Let's start with the most simple theory, that this was in fact just a sad suicide. Jennifer was, for some reason, sad and depressed enough to want to end it all. She wanted to make sure that she would have privacy and not be bothered, so she checked into the plaza to carry out her plan. A day into her stay, she decided that she wanted a little more time, so she extended her stay at the hotel. She sat in her room and watched television. She ordered room service. She drank soda, ate chips, but she kept getting these annoying messages to her television telling her that she needed to pay for her hotel stay, and she kept discarding the messages. But she most likely knew they were on to her, so she took a shower, dressed in her best black clothes, dressed for her own funeral, you could say, And when she heard the knock on her door and someone announced themselves as security, she realized, you know, the gig was up, her time had ended, and then she shot herself. It still doesn't really explain why she would keep her identity a secret. She clearly had some money. She probably could have paid for the hotel stay. So if she's just a regular person with really nothing to hide, she probably could have given the hotel a valid credit card, you know, but she didn't. Maybe she didn't want her family and loved ones to find out what had happened to her, so she didn't want to use her real name at the hotel at all. But since her death, the story of what happened to her has been talked about worldwide, and no one has ever come forward to say that they knew her. It's as if she was a ghost. Another thought I had was that Jennifer could have been having an affair with someone else who was staying at the hotel at that time. This would explain her overnight absence from her room. She was in her lover's room. It would also explain why she wanted to check in using a fake name. Maybe the person that she was there to see was married. Maybe his wife knew about Jennifer, had found out about their affair, and you know he'd convinced his wife like it's over. And he'd also convinced his wife that he was just in Oslo on business, but you know, his wife's not dumb, so she's going to call the hotel to see if her husband's girlfriend is also checked in and staying there. And this way, if she called the hotel, she wouldn't find what she was looking for because Jennifer had used a fake name. Maybe the person staying in room 2816 was Jennifer's lover, and he was the man she'd been seen with at reception and exchanging currency, and he'd accidentally left his paper in her room. Or maybe Mr. F., the Belgian businessman, was the one that she was there to see. And that's why he acted so shady when questioned, because he didn't want his wife to find out. Maybe Jennifer had planned to spend her last days with her lover and then just take her life because she was in love with him, but she knew that he would never leave his wife or they would never be together. And so she just wanted to end it all. Or maybe he was the one who killed her, right? This lover, whether it be, um, you know, Mr. F or the guy in room 2816. Maybe they were having such a great time together on Thursday when they were together all day. And Jennifer said, I wish it could be like this for always. And he was like, but it can't be. And she's like, well, it could be if I tell your wife, you know, and maybe this guy was like, I can't have this woman ruin my life. And he killed her. These are obviously theories, but it's not like any of this stuff hasn't happened before. Right. And I would be interested to see if this hotel had rooms that were adjoined by doors, as many hotels do. So sometimes there's adjoining rooms and then there's a door in between 
the two rooms, not the door that goes out to the hall, but a door that goes right into the other room. As we know, one of the rooms next to Jennifer's to her right was vacant at that time. And if someone knew what they were doing, they could easily slip into the next room and leave through the door of that room and out into the hallway, walking away as if nothing had happened after they killed her. Which would also explain why the door was still locked from the inside. Now, Stephen Pacheco of Trace Evidence Podcast, he also had an interesting theory that I wanted to touch on because I'd never thought of it before and I think it's, you know, very valid. So as we know, two shots were fired that night. The first was what police believed to be a test shot. Now, Stephen wonders if the first shot was actually the one that had killed Jennifer. So someone came in to kill her. Maybe they knocked on the door. She let them in. They argued. They fought. Whatever. They snuck up on her. Who knows? They climbed on top of her and shot her. Then in order to make it look as if she'd done it herself, the person put the gun in her hand and shot through the bed again before staging her body, putting the gun in her hand, you know, wrapping her thumb around it and then putting it on her chest. The whole test shot thing just has never made sense to me. And this does seem more possible. I do think that Jennifer Fergate was in intelligence, though, and I'm not alone in feeling that way. I also believe there's no way, no way that she checked into the hotel without providing ID or a credit card unless someone at the hotel was helping her. Maybe this is why the plaza did not want Sasha to talk to VG because they also knew that something was really off about the situation. Like I said at the start of the video, I would be interested to know if any other guests were allowed to check in that night without these required items, or if Jennifer was the only one. Sasha's supervisor was like, no, there's no way this could have happened. We have policies in place. This is unprecedented. And Sasha was like, yeah, definitely it could happen. There was a long line, you know, got to get the guests in their rooms. Happens all the time. If Jennifer was a spy trying to hide out in this hotel and not, you know, have anybody find her, she would have known that the busiest time at the plaza was when the last two or three planes came into Oslo and everybody was checking in. So she would have strategically planned to come in at that time. I don't believe that she arrived in Oslo on a plane. I think she came in via train, but that's a whole nother conversation. The train station was just like five minutes away. I think she had a passport, a fake passport at one point that she used to, you know, board the train and come from whatever country she'd come from into Norway and into Oslo. But I think she got rid of it before she went to the hotel because her identity was compromised. So Jennifer gets to the plaza. She doesn't have ID. She knows it's busy. She picks the guy who looks like he cares about his job the least. And she walks up to him and she's like, I'm checking in. But then she tells him, listen, I'm hiding from an abusive ex-boyfriend. He's crazy. He's going to kill me. I don't want him to find me. Uh, can we just act like you forgot to get my ID and credit card? I'm going to slip you like a crap ton of money right now, okay? It is very possible that Sasha could have just pocketed the money and looked the other way. I cannot explain why the next day, when she extended her stay and was again not asked for these things, how she got away with it, unless Sasha was behind the desk again or she just paid off another employee and told them the same story. But the fact that she was in the possession of an untraceable gun and a crap ton of ammo, the fact that there was no sign of who she was in that room or on her person, the fact that she removed the labels from her clothes, which is a common spy thing to do so that no one can trace you back to a country or a place, it all just seems much too professional and planned. Her absence from her hotel for the entire day and night of Thursday could mean that she either had a secondary place or location in Oslo that she was staying, which spies do usually have these secondary sites as a backup, or she was out on a mission. Maybe she was tracking someone and they figured it out, so they followed her back to the hotel and killed her. Maybe she was trying to get out of the spy game and she was meeting with someone who she thought was a friend and an ally, someone who was going to help her, but who was actually sent there to neutralize her and they followed her back to the hotel and killed her. Maybe her mission was to track or follow someone in that same hotel, the Belgian businessman or the mystery person in room 2816, and these people or this person figured out who she was and what she was doing and they killed her. Maybe the reason she had room 2816's paper was because she was attempting to identify who he was or who she was using the paper, and she snatched it either from the room, inside the room, or from outside of the room after it had been left out with old room service dishes or something. There's a million 
options. But in Unsolved Mysteries, a man named Ola Keldager, who'd been an E-14 group leader for the Norwegian Secret Service, was interviewed for this show. And he was asked about Jennifer, and he believes that Jennifer was a spy based on the evidence. In fact, when he was asked, if not intelligence, what could it be, Keldager responded, quote, I can't imagine that it could be anything else, end quote. He says the locked door means nothing, claiming that there's no such thing as locked doors for intelligence agents. Online, I found an article written in 2016 where a hacker named Cody Brikosius, who was a Mozilla software developer, he explained to an entire Black Hat conference how easy it was to gain instant, untraceable access to millions of hotel rooms that were protected by keycard locks made by Onity. And he did this by using a 32-bit key that would identify the specific hotel when plugged in to the DC power socket at the base of every door lock that uses keycards. And he showed that the whole process process from plugging this thing into the door to opening the door takes only 200 milliseconds. This can also be reverse engineered to lock a door behind you. So someone could have locked the door from the outside. And I know this all sounds crazy. You're over here thinking Stephanie's lost it. And you're thinking 2016 is, you know, a far distance from 1995. But you guys have to consider this. Intelligence agencies have this kind of technology decades before the rest of us figure it out. And this is once again assuming that the door is even locked from the inside, because the only proof that we have is the security guy opening it and being like, oh yeah, it was double locked, you know? Now, during Unsolved Mysteries, they mentioned the Oslo Accords and how Norway and the Oslo Plaza Hotel were important players in this agreement. Um, the Oslo Accords made me think of the tensions between Israel and Palestine, and the Accords were intended to bring peace, right, to lessen those tensions. This happened in 1993 when the accords were signed, but in 1995, the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated on November 4th during a peace rally in Tel Aviv. 1995 is the same year that we find Jennifer dead in the Plaza Hotel in Oslo. And Rabin was actually killed by a 25-year-old Israeli extremist specifically because he had participated in the Oslo Accords and, you know, this extremist did not want him to do this. Like, there was people who just didn't want peace and didn't want... I mean, it's much more complicated than that. I know I'm, I'm boiling it down because we don't have a lot of time to just talk about this for hours, which I could. But obviously, based on certain people's beliefs, they don't want to get along with certain other people. And usually it's about religion and a fight for territory and land and a right to be who you are and believe what you want to believe. And then there's a lot of that on both sides. So this young man who killed the prime minister, he did it because he was mad that, you know, Robin was trying to make peace with Palestine. So all of this then made me think about East Germany after World War II and how they were never big fans of Israel to the point where even after the Berlin Wall fell in uh, 1989, I believe it was, there was still no ambassadors exchanged between Israel and uh, East Germany. In fact, East Germany uh, did happen to be a big supporter of the Palestine Liberation Organization and supplied them with funds and weapons in their, their fights against Israel. Now, you could argue that after 1990, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the East Germany Secret Service, which was called the Stasi, it was also disbanded. That's the official word. But that's not necessarily true. And I mean, this could be a whole video. But there is evidence that the the Stasi continued. Uh, there's evidence that members of the Stasi were not punished. They weren't uh, brought to task for the horrible things that they had done. But they continued to be active well into the 2000s. If Jennifer's presence in Oslo was of the undercover nature and possibly related to the Oslo Accords and maybe to the assassination of uh, Israel's prime minister, it's very possible she could have been connected to the East German secret police. She would have been born in a time when the Berlin Wall was still up, when communism and terror were alive and well in East Germany. And, you know, ideologies like this that are ingrained in you from birth, they don't just vanish when a wall is taken down. I'm going to link an article I read called East Germany's Stasi a quarter century after it was dissolved. And this article was written in 2014, but it's really interesting. Um, and it'll send you down a rabbit hole if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And if anyone's interested in a quick five-minute history of how East Germany even became a thing and then wasn't a thing again, I'll throw it in at the end of the video. Anyways, if Jennifer was a spy, it makes sense why no one would come forward and claim her. Cal Dager said that in situations like these, both sides would keep quiet, and the side she was on, 
the intelligence agency that she was a part of, they would go to her family and tell them, you know, listen, your daughter died a hero, but you need to remain quiet for national security because that's always <laughs> that's always what these intelligence agencies say. Everything's a matter of national security. And then the agency would make sure that this family was, you know, financially taken care of for the rest of their lives to keep them quiet so that they wouldn't come forward and say, that's my daughter, that's my sister, that's my mother, that's my friend. Now, that is why this is my main theory. But I'm very interested in hearing what you all have to say about it and what you think of this case. What are your main theories? You know, put them in the comment section. I would love to hear about it. Now, for the five-minute history lesson of how Germany became so fractured after World War II, which led to a lot of bad years and bad times in East Germany. Now, this is a quick rundown. Obviously, I'm not going to hit on every detail, but it's just a brief overview for, like, understanding purposes. Um, So I know there's going to be people who are like, yeah, missed this. You're being very reductive. Yes, the five-minute history. All right, so the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany in August of 1939, and this was called the molotov ribbentrop Pact. And it's not Molotov after the cocktail, it's Molotov after one of the guys who signed the pact. Now, this pact was basically like a written agreement of peace between um, Germany, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. So Hitler and Stalin, right? Those are the two, the two main guys we're dealing with right now. And they would promise each other that they wouldn't aid or um, ally with any enemies of the other. So pretty much like the allied powers, like they're not going to hook up with the United States or France or the UK and help. So Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. And this launches World War II. And then Stalin, he waited, you know, a couple weeks. He was like, I'll give Hitler a chance to get in there, get settled. And then he went in on September 17th, and he also invaded Poland. So Stalin and Hitler are like, you know, pigs and shit right now. They're just loving themselves, loving their lives, just invading everyone and taking whatever they want. Because, see, there's like a secret portion in that non-aggression pact between Stalin and Hitler. So basically, they were like, any countries we invade and take over, we're going to like divide those amongst ourselves into spheres of influence. And listen, Stalin, he was holding up his end, okay? He was being a good buddy to Hitler. He even signed a neutrality pact in April of 1941 with Japan because Japan had signed a tripartite pact with Germany and Italy the previous year. So they were kind of like in a legit alliance. And even though the Soviet Union wasn't technically in their legit alliance yet, Stalin was like, I want to show Hitler I'm serious about this. Like, I'm a good friend. I'm loyal and I keep my word. But what he didn't know was that Hitler had been planning to attack the Soviet Union since the summer of 1940. Literally, like, before they even signed their non-aggression pact. And on June 22nd, 1941, Hitler did attack the Soviet Union, Operation Barbosa, and this officially, you know, like, null and voids that Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, the non-aggression pact. So Stalin's like, well, screw this guy, man. I'm going to go over to the Allied powers and I'm going to make nice with them. So from November 28th to December 1st, I believe, 1941, Stalin meets with Winston Churchill and FDR at the Tehran Conference. And they want to talk about what a two-front war on Germany would look like. And a two-front war basically means like, I'm the Soviet Union, I'm huge, I'm over here, I'm going to like attack them. And then you're like the Allied powers over here and you're going to attack Germany too. So we're going to like, ah, two-front them. And to be fair, without the help of the Soviet Union, although Stalin was not like the super nicest guy ever, uh, we probably would have had a harder time winning World War II. Might not have even been possible. And the Soviet Union really did suffer a lot of losses. In fact, their loss of life was more than anybody else who was involved in the war. So Berlin fell to the Soviets in 1945. Uh, The Soviet Union lost like 20 million people. And I believe that's just the people who were fighting, not like civilians and things like that. It was a rough war. I think the number is something like one third of all of the World War II casualties happened um, from the Soviet Union or in the Soviet Union. They didn't kill one-third of the casualties. They were one-third of the casualties. That's a lot. So then we have Allied-occupied Germany. So they took a portion of Germany and they split it up amongst the the four Allied powers, the Soviet Union, uh, the UK, the US, and France. And at first, the Soviet Union was like, France, 
really, they get some stuff. They didn't even do anything, right? That's what the Soviet Union really said. Most likely, that's what Stalin actually said. But basically, um, the Allied powers, they asserted their sovereignty over over this portion of Germany that they had they'd taken over. And it was bad. It was bad for the German people, Um I don't, I don't think it was really – I mean, I know World War II was bad. The Holocaust was bad. But there were so many citizens in Germany who did not agree with what was going on, who didn't um, part, partake in it, who even helped in any way they could. Uh, they, they were severely punished for this. So the four powers, they take occupied Germany and they divide it into four like sections. Berlin happened to be smack dab in the middle of the Soviet Union's section. But because Berlin was the capital of Nazi Germany, Berlin was the most heavily populated city in Germany. It was like a very important city. They actually took Berlin and they split Berlin up as well. So it was bad, you know, all over for anybody in occupied Germany. But obviously the areas where the Soviet Union were, you know, controlling, they were were the worst because Stalin's pissed. Stalin's pissed that Hitler made him look stupid. Stalin's pissed that he had to lose so many people and so much money fighting this war. So he's being vindictive right now. He wants to take it out on the people of Germany. And he also wants the people of Germany to be super communist because that's what he was. So he stripped his portions of Germany of like all their manufacturing equipment. He said it was reparations for, uh, you know, what he had lost in the war. And basically, East Germany, it's in a bad state. It falls into like poverty, quality of life spiraling all over Germany, but specifically in East Germany, it's bad because, you know, communism really has never been successful anywhere. It's just, it's not, it's not a great idea, um, especially when you have a dictator like Stalin. But in the Western occupied sector, the U.S. and the U.K. and France are like, this isn't really a good idea. Like, we don't want to make these people become dependent on us. What we want to do is, you know, make sure, like, all the Nazi shit is gone. But then we want to give them a chance to provide for themselves and hold free and fair democratic elections and, you know, get good leaders in here. Like, we're not trying to be here forever It seems like Stalin's trying to be there forever. So uh, they began investing in like German industry, trying to put money back into Germany. I think it was 1949 when the Marshall Plan came. No, it was 1947. I just looked it up. But this was a a basically uh, just a a plan to bring aid to Germany. And everybody in in eastern Germany is like, yo, they're getting aid. They're getting like help. You know, the, the UK and the US and France are like putting money into to their part of the country like what's happening here and Stalin was like that's not going to happen here okay because I've got my own plan for economic stimulation communism so further divisions happening between east and west Germany and nowhere is this more evident than Berlin which is smack dab in the middle of Soviet territory but also split in half too so Stalin cuts off all of the roads that go into Berlin so that the allied powers or the western the Western rulers of Germany, they can't go into Berlin. So then the U.S., U.K., France, they start airlifting food and supplies into, you know, their people that are in Berlin because they're not going to just leave them to Stalin. And they did this for roughly a year, I think 11 months. And by 1949, basically, um, Germany wasn't occupied any longer, right? But technically, it still was pretty messed up. I know for a fact that the Allied powers, so uh, the UK and the US and France, like they were out of there by 1949, 1950, and they'd allowed Germany to kind of hold their own elections and bring in like democratic leaders. But Berlin was still this huge issue, right? Because West Berlin was still aligning itself with Western Germany, even though they were technically in like Eastern Germany. And uh, the people in East Berlin were looking at West Berlin and they're like, you guys have food? You guys are, like, having concerts. There's music playing. People are happy. There's education going on. Everybody's doing well. You own your own home. What? And the people in West Berlin are looking at the people in East Berlin. They're like, oh, that's so sad that you're not allowed to have any property. And you have to work all day long but have nothing at the end of it. That sucks because people were leaving East Berlin, right? They were looking over at West Berlin. They're like, obviously, things are better there. So they're all defecting. They're going over to uh, West Berlin. So during the Cold War, right, the Berlin Wall was built by the German Democratic Republic, which 
he's anything but not really a democratic republic at that time at least because they were losing people they were losing important people skilled laborers they were losing um, intellectuals they were losing people that were helping uh, the the country and they didn't want to lose those people but those people didn't want to be there because they didn't want to be giving all of their skills and, and get nothing back for it and that's where communism really has a, a failing place it's fine to envision a socialist utopia. It's even fine to, you know, try to enact certain socialist kind of policies. But straight out communism is bad because you have a lack of creativity. You have a lack of invention, of innovation, because people are motivated by money and they're motivated by, you know, um, recognition and things like that. But in, in the Soviet Union during communism, it was like, it doesn't matter if you come up with the most in, amazing invention, like you're not going to get paid for it. It belongs to the state. Nothing belongs to you. You don't get recognition for that. And a lot of terrible things happened in the Soviet Union. I, there was this a group of farmers, I can't remember what they were called, uh, but they they basically had started off in, in poverty. And then as the years went on, they like worked their way up to the point where they weren't just farming on other people's land. They were having their own land and then they had their own farms and then they became successful. Communism hits Russia and then you got some guy standing in front of you being like, yeah, I know you worked your butt off to go from the bottom to the top, but now I'm going to take everything from you. And if you don't like that, I'm going to kill you or put you in a re-education camp, which is basically the same thing. So it was just bad. But that's basically me rambling for 10 minutes about uh, Germany after World War II. And there's so much more that I could have said and would have wanted to say. But uh, that will be for another day or maybe another discussion over a nice bottle of wine someplace when we all can get together someday. And we can talk about history and true crime and mystery and all of these things. Thank you guys so much for being here with me. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you have haven't subscribed yet and if you are subscribed already remember to check and make sure you still are because youtube unsubscribes people from my channel probably especially after this video because i said the word gun like a million times also hit the like button if you liked it share it if you think it's worth sharing leave me a comment let me know what you thought subscribe to crime weekly my podcast that i host or co-host with my co-host derek lavasser retired police detective every friday new episodes come out Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you guys so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. I will see you very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on